Hey y'all, it's Becky here from The Becca Sphere, and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Becky, and every Tuesday and Thursday we talk about the climate here. The problems, yes, but the solutions, yes. So if that sounds like something you would be interested in, go ahead and click that subscribe button below, hit the like, comment, share, all that good stuff. Yeah, I can definitely hear you, Mom. I'm attempting to FaceTime my mom because she can't be here tonight. Um, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> uh, I don't know where to put you because I'm trying to put you further away from the microphone. <laughs> eh, okay, we'll see how this goes. Okay, anyways. Hi. Okay, so, squeaky chair. Um, we are going to talk about the second to last part of all we can save, which if you haven't been following along so far, oh, by the way, this is the Climate Book Club. Um, every Thursday at this time, I do a Climate Book Club. So yeah, right now we're reading All We Can Save, which is written by women in the climate movement. Um, and it has been a really nice read, honestly, highly recommend. And so we're at our second to last section of it, which means that, yes, I have already picked out the next book. And it is uh, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster by Bill Gates. And I will be doing it with a new co-host. Sorry, Mom. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, his name is Mickey, and you will learn more about Mickey soon. That's all I'm going to say. Um yeah, so anyways, uh, I will also possibly be using a different format, but I'll let you know. I'll let you know for sure by next week. All right, so anyways, let's get on to the second to last section. I can't believe that we've gotten this far. Okay, so this is called Nourish, and the beginning has a lovely picture. All right. So, Nourish. We will work together to restore what is broken. We will slowly remake all things new. Very nice. And by the way, for people that are here so far, if you could let me know if my sound quality, it, if it sounds the same, better, something horribly wrong, please let me know. Because again, this is my first time using a new microphone. So, all right. So the first section of or the first piece in this section. Thank you, Paul, sounds good. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so this is called Solutions Underfoot and it's by Jane Zel Zelikova. And um, so this is, we're starting off with dirt. Um, the, the whole thing is dirt, which is awesome. <laughs> well, a little bit of ocean and seaweed in there too. Anyways, um, so the first thing that I liked from her section is she quoted Rachel Carson because Rachel Carson's bae. Um, and Rachel Carson said that, quote, in nature, nothing exists alone. And um, this is in the relationship of ecology because ecology is the main focus of the author. Sorry, I need to either let my cat or my dog in. I'm not sure which one. Hi, Rue. Come on. You can't choose between the door. Okay. You know when a pet, you try to let them in and then they just kind of like stay in like in limbo. <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's not helpful, but he's here. Anyways, um okay, so yeah, so we're talking about ecology in this section. And uh basically she really talks about how things all really need to be together to work in cohesion. So, um in this case, one of the main factors that's been neglected is soil. And so soil is, as she describes, the skin of the earth. Over the last 12,000 years, we've lost about 133 billion metric tons of carbon from this soil, stripped away as humans converted native grasslands and forests into agricultural fields and rangelands, roads, and cities. The main driver of this loss is the plow. Um, and so that's basically, she's talking about how it's really important to have that soil growth and to have the nourishment in the soil, all the microbes in there, the soil to be live so that it actually helps support the ecosystem. And I think we just kind of think of soil as, um, high root, good stretch. 
<laughs> I like how we, or I don't like how we think of soil as um, inorganic and as an object, you know, instead it really is a being within itself. Like it's, it has living organisms in it. It has microbes in it. It has um, chemical compounds that are occurring within it and um, important phenomena that we see like biode biodegrading and decomposition. Um, and so it has a very important role to play in our environment. And it's something that's very not spoken for. So that's what this section is about, basically. Um, she said, today we use more than a third of the planet's land to grow food for 7.8 billion people worldwide. And the United Kingdom may be only a few decades away from losing its soil fertility, along with, along with other parts of the world, such as Brazil, Central African countries, and parts of Southeast Asia. So because we have not really been treating the soil well, it's dying um, and it's not as able to support life or to support water, as we'll talk about more later. Um, and so that's a huge problem because obviously our whole uh, ecosystem relies on the health of the soil. Good stuff. Um, she says, rebuilding soil requires fundamentally rethinking our resilience on technology and chemicals to deliver what soil can do on their own, what soils can do on their own, support life. So we've been using, so far we've been using plows, we've been using herbicides and fertilizer and all these different technologies and techniques to basically do what the earth was made to do. <laughs> Um, and we've been playing God so long with it that it's dying because humans are not that great at keeping things alive. Um, and so we need to just allow it to do its thing and to, yeah, to, to heal basically, um, which is a lot more of a hands-off method, but there's a lot more to it and that we will get into in a different section. But she talks about um, the microbes in the soil, which carbon sequestrate, which basically means that it takes the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and stores it in the soil. And that's a really, that's the natural way of doing it. You know, trees do that, plants do that, and microbes do that, as well as algae in the ocean. It does it too. It just takes whatever the um it takes the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere not whatever it takes the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and uses it as food but also puts it either into the ocean or into dirt or into dead bodies basically um and let me turn the page all right plants don't use every ounce of carbon they capture through photosynthesis for their own growth the extra seeps out of roots into soil as, um, ex mm -mm. mom, can you? Ex exudates. Exudates. <laughs> Never heard that word. Uh, a secretion hungry soil microbes consume. Microbes use some of the exudes for their own growth, keeping that carbon underground and release some of it back into the atmosphere. So that's what's working on in the soil microscopically. Um, the bulk of stored carbon is actually dead microbes known as microbial necromass. And um, it's it also, uh, when soil is more healthy, it's not only better for plants to grow in, but it also helps with flood control. So, which is something I didn't know. Um, and basically she said that better, uh, it means better water f infiltration and higher nutrient and water retention. As soil health improves, agricultural fields become more resilient to the ups and downs of the changing climate. Mom, I'm canceling you. You're moving too much. Okay, love you, Mom. Bye. I don't know if you guys can tell the difference between this lack of static versus static, but it was there. <laughs> um, sorry, mom. 
<laughs> I know, I kicked her out. It's a tough crowd, you know? <laughs> um, sorry, Mom. I guess I'm taking it on my own. I'm talking about dirt on my own. Um, okay, so where was I before I kicked my mother out? I feel so bad. Okay. Um, so let's see. So, yeah. So basically it helps with flooding. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> it helps with flooding, um, to have healthier soil. And, um, she says better water infiltration and higher nutrient and water retention as soil health improves. Agricultural fields become more resilient to the ups and downs of a changing climate. And so a way to do that is you plow less, um, you plant a more diverse set of crops and you grow cover crops during the uh, follow seasons to keep the soil covered. So just have the soil be less um, constantly in the sun because that also kills the microbes. And she says diversity is the magical elixir for better soils. I liked that. And she says, draw down uh, the powers of soil and photosynthesis and microbes, draw down about 10% of the carbon dioxide we emit every year. And that's, that is not, that's something to shake a stick at. I mean, or is it nothing to shake a stick at? Which one's a good thing? <laughs> Which one's a large thing um, to shake a stick at? Anyways, uh, it's, it's a big deal. Um, she says there's a growing community of farmers and ranchers who are excited to regenerate their land, which is really cool. And I definitely want to do a video on this. And if I could cut, if I could talk to a farmer who wants to do this, that would be great. Um, I need to actually email people anyways. Um, okay. So yeah, so it, she says that one of the great things about this whole thing is that it doesn't hinge on any technological um, innovation. It's an area that we have the knowledge and technology to do. We just need to do it. Um, she says diversity of, oh, and then she compares the, um, the climate or the soil situation to the climate movement. And she says, in order for us to come up with solutions like this and to do them properly, we need to have a diverse group of people in the climate movement. They can't just all be white. <laughs> so we, we need more perspectives from different situations to come in and help with figuring all this out. The more the merrier, right? As entrepreneurs and investors dream up huge machines that can pull carbon out of the air, I can't help but notice the hubris of relying on technology when ecology has been here all along. And I agree. I think that, you know, we need to be able to use the natural resources we have. And while planting trees is great, and a lot of organizations are working on doing that as a form of carbon offset, I think we also need to value and think more deeply about soil and um, its regenerative processes and try to nourish the soil again um, in order to actually really make a difference. And that would help with trees too. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> mom says we need both. Yes. Okay. We need both. But I think that we need, um, we're thinking a lot about the carbon sequestration side and we're thinking a lot about the tree side that we aren't thinking as much about the soil side. We need to think about the soil side too. Yes. So that was the first section. Oh, hi, Jack. Oh my gosh. It's a family reunion. Hi. <laughs> okay. So, um, the next one is, I think a poem. Um, it's kind of a list, but I think it's a poem. I I'm starting to question the definition of poems a little bit, but anyways, okay. It's called notes from a climate victory garden by Louise Mather Johnson. Rebalance, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, methane, and water vapor with photosynthesis. Recognize, plants cool by evaporation, ground cover, shade, and precipitation. Replant, lawns with, bleh, lawns with victory gardens as in world, world war past. Regenerate. Biodiverse farms with trees, flowers, herbs, pasture, animals. Restore. 
carbon out of air and back into soil where it belongs. Replace industrial monocultures with regenerative permaculture. Revisit food production by many small farms, not a few mega farms. Reject fossil fuel based pesticides, plastics, and propaganda. Rethink healthy ecosystems and economies for all life. Relocalize slow food, slow lifestyles, and slow economies. Rekindle simple and good nature and nurture, feeling overthinking. Refeel kinship with pivoting sunflowers and starry fireflies. Revive wildlands, woodlands, wetlands, wildlife, waterways. Reestablish health of bees, butterflies, birds, bats, beetles. Respect work of insects, both pollinating and recomposting life. Remember, everything is connected. Everyone lives downstream and downwind. Reimagine deep conservation, cooperation, and community. Rebalance. Nature knows. Mimic her. Sense her. Be her. Wow. I really liked that. Um, (laughs) Because it was just straight to the point. But yeah, all of those things. And honestly, it sounds so nice. Like, what do you guys think? The idea of slow food, slow lifestyle, and slow economy sounds really appealing. (laughs) Imagine just being able to, like, go to a farmer's market and that be your main shopping place for the most part. Like, you can get other things from the farmer's market or for, like, the regular market. Like, okay, what I do is there's a Safeway right next to a... the parking lot that the farmer's market uses in my area is a safe way. And so I go to the farmer's market and get everything I can from the farmer's market and then get the rest from safe way kind of thing. And it'd be cool if everybody like prioritized that or respected when things were out of season. And so got used to, you know, waiting for the special occasion when they're back, you know, um, doing slower lifestyles where not everything is a competition or, or getting to the next personal gain fast, you know, just kind of taking a deep breath, enjoying life, you know, um, retirement. Uh, no, I, I, I don't want to just golf in retirement either though. I want to do things, but I don't know. Anyways, my rambling. <sighs> okay. The next one is called solutions at sea. Get a drink here. Hmm. Okay. Solutions at Sea by Emily Stengel. I loved it. Of course you loved this one, Mom. (laughs) I know you would love this one. She's obsessed with what we're about to talk about. Anyways, I'm here to tell you about the ocean, but I'll start with my roots, which are firmly on ground or on land. So that's how she starts. Um, And basically she talks about how she started being in the farmer's market and then she was a farmer and then she helped her parents with a restaurant and stuff. Um, But she knows that people told me they were having trouble making ends meet because of struggles related to household issues, such as affording health insurance while working one of the deadliest jobs in America, farming or finding appropriate childcare in rural communities. The farming population was aging out with no succession plan, and farmland was too expensive for young farmers to buy. So it, the, the idyllic lifestyle was dying, basically, which I feel like a lot of us can relate to with many things. Um, yeah, she said that agriculture is using 90% of the world's fresh water resources, so it's also a drain on the environment itself, too. So, then she heard of this thing called regenerative ocean farming. Now, what is that, you might ask? Well, basically, it's farming seaweed and um, smaller, like, mollusks, such as clams and oysters, and... Um, Basically, just yeah, farming the ocean. And here's some here's some support for it. These crops require zero input. 
no fresh water, no animal feed, no fertilizers, no pesticides. They're also restorative. Seaweeds such as kelp are often called the sequoia of the sea because like sequoia trees, they are heroes of carbon sequestration. Oysters filter up to 50 gallons of water per day, removing nitrogen that seeps into our waters from land-based agricultural runoff, a major factor in aquatic dead zones. If you want to hear more about dead zones, I highly recommend checking out um, the video by Shel Beasley, um, supported by Bill Gates. <laughs> he, he financially supported a couple of the climate YouTubers out there and promoted his book in the process. And it, it, it was a cool thing. Anyways, um, so she did a video on that because it was something he mentioned in the book. Highly recommend you check out her video. I will leave a link in, is it? I can never remember which side. I think it's a sign um, when it's being recorded. Obviously not at this moment. Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. So she says uh, you can have a commercially scaled farm, scale farm up and running within a year with an investment as low as $20,000, which is pretty stinking low. Seaweeds can be used for food, but also fertilizers, animal feeds, and even bioplastics. Yeah. Um, and what she'll talk about later and something that has been kind of like recharging in the in media's mind is um, how if you feed cows seaweed, then their methane output is less. Like they burp and they poop or burp and they fart less. Uh, methane out. So it also um, decreases the carbon footprint of or the greenhouse gas footprint of um, of agriculture, uh, animal agriculture. <sighs> okay. Um, <laughs> so then she talks about uh, a nonprofit that she joined called Green Wave, which basically helps people get into this business. There's more than 5,000 ocean farmers to be from more than 100 companies who have expressed interest and want, to, and want support. And she says, uh, one study shows that, oh, this is what I was referring to. One study shows that supplementing livestock feed with a small amount of seaweed can reduce methane output by more than half in cattle. So there's, there's the study. Um, and this is all part of what she calls the blue-green economy, which I think should be called the teal economy or the turquoise economy. I'm just saying there's other colors, but the blue-green <laughs> economy, um, which relies heavily on um, sustainable practices, uh, clean energy, and ocean farming. I like it. Um, and she says that because it's such a new industry, they're trying to start it off on the right foot, which means having a circulatory business model that cuts waste and keeps valuable resources in use. So it looks at every part of its supply chain to decrease the amount of waste and environmental impact as much as it can. Um, and also another interesting field that is emerging is that women are taking the helm of this industry. So while men have mainly dominated marine spaces in the past, women are the ones that are really starting to pick up the idea of, um, of ocean farming. And we can see that firsthand here with my mother. Mom, when are you getting an ocean farm? Hmm? You live close enough to the water, you can do it. Just saying. Stay tuned. <laughs> that would be a great video, Mom. I'll do it with you. Uh, if if you paid the twenty thousand grand, anyways. Um, <laughs> a recent World Bank report states that farming regenerative species is in less than five percent of the U.S. waters could produce protein equivalent to three trillion cheeseburgers create more than 50 million new jobs and absorb 10 million tons of nitrogen and 135 million tons of carbon per year. And right now we're only farming 0.004%. <laughs> Good for you, mom. You go. You go. All right. So, yeah. And I told myself on here, get my little note here, that... When I get up the website that I've mentioned a few times on here, which I want to call the Climate Hub, no one take it. Um, surprisingly, there isn't one. 
but basically it would just be a place where people can find resources that they want to to go further into different industries for the climate and learn more and all that kind of stuff, find their place in the movement, basically. Um, one of the sections I want to do is emerging job markets and definitely putting ocean farming in that, in that. So that's just saying, make a mental note with me. All right. The next piece is a poem and it's called Characteristics of Life by Camille T. Dungley. Dungy, sorry. I need to take a sip. All right. A fifth of animals without backbones could be at risk of extinction, says scientists. BBC Nature News. Ask me if I speak for the snail, and I will tell you I speak for the snail. I speak of underneathedness and the welcome of mosses, of life that springs up, little lives that pull back and wait for a moment. I speak for the damselfly, water skeet, mollusk, the caterpillar, the beetle, the spider, the ant. I speak for the time before spinelessness was frowned upon. Ask me if I speak for the moon jelly. I will tell you one thing today and another tomorrow, and I will be consistent as anything alive on earth. I move as the currents move with the breezes. What part of your nature drives you? You, in your cubicle, ought to understand me. I filter and filter and filter all day. Ask me if I speak for the Nautilus and I will be silent as the Nautilus shell on a shelf. I can be beautiful and useless if that's all you know to ask me. Ask me what I know for longing and I will speak of distances between meadows of night blooming flowers. I will speak the impossible hope of the firefly. You with the candle burning and only one chair at your table must understand such wordless desire. To say it is mindless is missing the point. Okay, so when I first read that, I was really confused about what the, who the who this um, narrator was in this piece. And I think, and I'm not, I'm still very much not sure. So please let me know what you guys think is, who you think is the narrator of this piece. Um, I think it might just be a, be a, uh, something without a backbone. <laughs> um, like a, a creature, I guess. Maybe like a, the part that says, um. I filter and filter and filter all day. It makes me think that maybe it's like, I don't know, like an a oyster or something. Because it knows of what it means to be spineless, I guess. But then it's also making you question, well, what is like, what is mindlessness? And if you don't ask me to do anything like helping you filter out all the fresh water, then I won't. <laughs> Um, but you just aren't asking the right questions, maybe? I don't know. That's my little theory, but I'm not sure. Okay. The next piece is called Black Gold, and it's by Leah Pennyman. Um, so she is... Actually, I'm not sure what her ethnic background is. I'm guessing she's Black because she's referring to the relationship that... Um, uh, people of color in general experience, but primarily African American people experience having to do with agriculture and what it means to be with like agriculture and soil and all that kind of stuff with such a complicated history. Um, I'll explain. So, almost without exception, when I ask Black visitors to the farm what they think when uh, what they think of when they see the soil they respond with slavery or plantation so it's really um they were going to a black farm and they still said that and she says i want to read this one part it's in a section called our sacred ancestral relationship with soil the truth is that for thousands of years, Black people have had a sacred relationship with soil that far surpasses our 
our okay yeah um that far that far surpasses our 246 year of enslavement and 75 years of sharecropping in the united states for many this period of land-based terror has devastated that connection we have confused the subjection our ancestors experienced on land with the land herself naming her the oppressor and running towards paved streets without looking back we do not stoop, sweat, harvest, or even get dirty because we imagine that would revert us to bondage. Part of the work of healing our relationship with soil is unearthing and relearning the lessons of soil reverence from the past. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to let her speak on that, on that part because she just described it so well. Um, how... Uh, there's a disconnect between who the oppressor is and, and the land itself. And she said that the history of um, black people's sick relationship with the soil went back as far as Cleopatra, where the earthworm was considered a sacred animal. And also there was the African dark earths and this black gold has high concentrations of calcium and phosphorus as well as 200 to 300% more organic carbon than soils typically in the region. And that's because the area was, was um, taken such good care of by the people there. She, she pointed out George Washington Carver was a pioneer in regenerative farming and one of the first agricultural scientists in the United States to advocate for the use of leguminous covered crops, nutrient-rich mulching, and diversified horticulture. Um, so there's a lot of ties to black culture and soil. She says in the section of um, the impacts of our estrangement from soil. It took only a few decades of intense tillage to drive around 50% of the original organic matter from the soil into the sky as carbon dioxide. And that's when the Europeans settled in North America. And something that I remember um, discussing in, in a class on anthropogenic uh, changes is and anthropogenic is human caused. Um, so the Anthropocene, which is what we're currently in, is the epoch in which the human in which humans have impacted the environment so much that it's changed from when humans were not there. And one of the questions that we have in class is what is the beginning of the epoch? And most people say the Industrial Revolution, which would be a very fair answer because it's it's when a lot of CO2 started entering the atmosphere um, from technological boom. However, there is an argument, and I honestly agree with this argument, that it came during um, when, when hunters and gatherers became farmers and started to transform the land in a way that has never been transformed before. And that is what she's saying right here. That means that human-caused climate change started not just with the Industrial Revolution, but with the exploitation of the soil. And so that's a really interesting perspective. And it makes the Anthropocene start a lot late, or it started much longer ago than with the theory of Industrial Revolution being the beginning of it. So I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in... Uh, in the chat or in the comments, when do you think the Anthropocene started? Another one is when the Great Expansion happened. So that was when um, Western colonization happened. So it's either, it was either Western colonization or, um, or when agriculture began or industrial revolution. Um, so there's a lot of different theories. She said soil Degrade, degradation alone may increase sorry soil degradation alone may decrease food production by 30 percent over the next 30 years so this is also a human crisis yeah um again a lot of things are connected food shortage with climate change they're connected for many reasons 
And uh, she says, in the United States today, nearly 85% of people who work on the land are Hispanic or Latinx and do not enjoy the same labor protections under the law as other American workers in the sector. So she starts talking about um, the the inequality aspect of this for not just um, Black people and their history with agriculture and the soil and plantation and slavery, but also with um, Latinx and Latino people now. And she says, pesticide exposure, wage theft, unconscious, Un- uncompensated overtime, child labor, lack of collective bargaining, and sexual abuse are all too common experiences in the uh, farm workers today. Quote, if you're not affected by climate change today, that itself is a privilege, says climate activist Andrea Manning. And then she talks about black farmers uh, and, like now and how they're healing with what happened could also be, it could be mutual beneficial to them and to the soil. Um, Agriculture continues to have a profound impact on the climate, along with forestry, deforestation, and land use. It contributes roughly 24% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Now, Black farmers are using heritage practices to reduce emissions and to capture excess carbon from the air. So now we're taking a page out of other non-Western forms of farming. So there's silvoplaster, which is an indigenous system that integrates nuts and fruit trees, uh, forage, and grasses to feed grazing livestock. So that's one method. Another method is called regenerative agriculture, which involves minimum soil disturbance, organic production, compost application, and the use of cover crops and crop rotation. And yeah, and then she, uh, let's see, what else do I want to share? So then she talks about three main case examples um, of women farmers now who are employing practices um, that were just mentioned. And I'm going to leave it up to you guys to read a lot of that stuff, but I'll do little highlights. For example, um, silver plaster systems can absorb more than two metric tons of carbon per acre every year, which is a lot. And um, nature abhors a monoculture and monocultures are where the where it's just one plant that you see for miles, that's monoculture and um, permaculture. It's a permaculture. I'm forgetting the right word, but the method that is better for the soil is to use multiple plants and to diversify. Um, yeah. Let's see. There's a lot in that section. Um, I recommend you read it. I'm going to move on to the next one, which is called Ode to Dirt, and is a poem by Sharon Olds. Ready? Here, I need a drink first. Cheers. All right. Ode to Dirt. Dear Dirt, I am sorry I slighted you. I thought that you were only the background for the leading characters, the plants and animals and human animals. It's as if I had loved only the stars and not the sky, which gave them space in which to shine. Subtle, various, sensitive, you are the skin of our terrain. You're our democracy. When I understand, I had never honored you as a living equal. I was ashamed of myself, as if I had not recognized a character who looked so different from me. But now I see all, uh, now I see us all, made of the same basic materials, cousins of that first exploding from nothing. In our intrinsic intrinsic equation together. Oh, dirt, help us find ways to serve your life. You who have brought us forth and fed us 
and who at the end will take us in and rotate with us and wobble and orbit. I love that poem. <laughs> I love that poem. Some of my favorite parts are um, where she calls Earth our democracy. And she says that we're all made of the same basic materials, cousins from the first exploding from nothing, our intrinsic, our intricate equation together. I can't pronounce intricate equation very well, but it's a beautiful description of what the overall global ecosystem is. It is just an intricate equation. It's a web. And you have brought us forth, fed us, and at the end will take us to rotate and wobble and orbit with the rest of the earth. Love that. Okay, the next piece is called Water is a Verb by Judith D. Swartz. Judith D. Swartz. So she basically um, talks about the importance of the water cycle, and it's a it's a really good piece. It's a little complicated. So um, I would highly recommend you read it on your own. I'm only going to give you the highlights of what I found the most interesting in the way of phrases, but please read these on your own. They're really good. I'm going to keep saying that. I will keep saying that. Okay. The amount of water in the aerial river above the Amazon rainforest exceeds the water flowing in the Amazon itself. Mic drop. Don't drop my mic. I just got it. It's pretty. How's it sounding? Is it sounding good? Mic check. Okay. Um, in fact, the transfer of thermal energy via the phase changes of water is the primary means by which our planet manages temperature. So that's another fun factoid about the water cycle is that water, just the moving of it. Thanks, Shauna. It's, it is important for how we regulate the overall temperature, which is also why it's bad that the ocean's warming. Um, but anyways, when we make the connection between water and climate, the discussion tends to go in one direction. The many ways that climate change will bear on water. So, for example, um, higher temperatures will be subject to heavier rains, more intense storms, sea level rise all that kind of stuff. But we don't talk about the impact of water on the climate. First of all, water is actually one of the most potent greenhouse gases when it is a vapor. But water is also an ally. Um, she talks about water as a verb, expanding the volume or entrenching, changing state in its ongoing dialogue with the land and sun. And every 1% increase in soil organic matter represents an additional 20,000 gallons of water per acre held in the ground. So the relationship between the health of the soil and the water cycle is also very apparent. What we perceive as a lack of water problem is often the inability to keep water in the ground, a symptom of soil that's lost its carbon. So soil without carbon cannot hold as much water in the ground, causing more flooding problems and more droughts because we don't have as much groundwater. So, yeah, it's all connected. Goodness. <sighs> and 80 and 90% of the water that we, what is it? Okay, the source. <laughs> So water from the air mostly comes from transpiration, not just evaporation. So those are the opposites. So evaporation is when water goes up and um, and is evaporated. We know what that means. Yes, Becky, use the word in the definition. And But the majority of the water that we get is transpiration, which is where it goes from being a, um, a gas to a liquid. Basically, think of the plant sweating. And just one tree can sweat or transpire more than 26 gallons of water. Um, and just one 
tree on a sunny day represents three times the cooling capacity of an air conditioned system in a five star hotel room. So new, new idea. One of my, uh, my, one of my houses, one of the houses that my parents used to live in or rent in, it had a tree through like the middle of the house. It had like an arborium in like the middle of the house. Bring those back. I like that. Make that be the natural AC. Almost build a house around a tree. Why not? That's that's all I have to say. Put a giant redwood just up through an apartment building. Okay. But give it room to grow. <laughs> um, yes, that's my idea. Also, another fun idea I had today was the government should incentivize people to get vaccinated by giving them extra paid travel time. That's my other great idea of the day. Spread the word, make it happen. Okay. We have so far neglected the role of functioning ecological systems in climate regulation. So back to, back to the subject folks. Um, but basically we need to look at how the ecological system isn't functioning as well as it could be and func have it function more optimally. So we're kind of doing that already with energy systems. So why don't we do that with ecological systems? And she says, bring back the climate victory garden, which I am so for, like, I need to get on that with my apartment building because we do have a plot that definitely could be a victory garden. And reserve a section, or you can reserve a section of lawn for pollinator, pollinator, poll, pollinator attracting plants. So, you know, flowering plants that are local for the local bees to pollinate. And supporting farmers who grow crops without pesticides. So, organics. And, yeah, and bring it back in a term that she calls oasification, which is creating beautiful spaces in an area where there used to not be one, or there used to be, but then humans happened, and then there wasn't one, you know, that. Okay, <laughs> the next section, and I will tell you, we got, this is the last section. So, is everybody listening? We all good? Hello, hello. Okay. Need a drink? Mm -hmm. Okay. This last section is called The Seed Underground by Janice Ray. Agriculture has created in us a story-based, community-reliant, land-loving people. It has given us a head start on what I call the age of bells, the time when bells, cowbells, dinner bells, bells of flowers, will again be ringing across the hills and plains. We are coming to the new age of agriculture better prepared, knowledgeable about growing, able to do with less, happy in our communities, firm in gender and racial equality, healthier. I believe that the organic and local food movement is leading the way to recreating cultures that are vibrant and, virtu and vital. Not virtual, but right now kind of virtual. <laughs> What we are witnessing in agriculture is no less than a revolution. And that was the main part that I highlighted from this section. It's only one page. So like I could read the whole thing, but I'm going to encourage you guys to read it because it's really good as is everything else in this book. So yeah, this should be a staple on people's shelves. I'm just saying along with drawdown, definitely also drawdown. So drawdown was mentioned a lot in this, um, in this section. And, um, yes, small, small farmers are awesome. Honestly, support them as much as you can go to the farmer's market every weekend. If you can just make it a regular shopping thing, like a regular shopping trip, if you're able to. So draw down. Yes, it is possibly keeping up my laptop right now. Sorry, the book, um, I will replace. Well, okay. Sorry. No, I will. I will. I will just drop it down. Okay. Hi, so Drawdown, if you haven't heard of this. Oh, mom wants me to read the last paragraph. Okay. How shall we live as we believe in the future? Or as if we believe in the future, 
as if every one of us is a seed, which, as you know, is a sacred thing. In my wildest dreams, the seed of every species are speaking to me, calling out, in all the bare spots on earth, plant us and let us grow. All on all the edges, plant seeds. And that's a beautiful little quote. On, on all edges, plant seeds. So this is Drawdown. And if you haven't heard about it, you need this book. Straight up. It is um, basically, as it describes, the most comprehensible plan ever proposed to reverse global warming edited by Paul Hawkins. And it is amazing. It has all these different solutions. So what did I turn on? I turned on women and girls, family planning. And it is number seven for the most useful way of, or most useful one thing to curb climate emissions. They say that it will reduce it, or they will reduce oh, family planning, which is basically giving women contraceptives and cho and allowing them to choose how many kids they want and when, um, is considered to reduce CO2 levels by 59.6 gigatons, which is a very good impact. And then it shows the impact below. So there's each, each, there's a bunch of them, like magic. I will open one other. Ready, sit. This one, which is Multistrata Agroforestry, number 28. And I don't know what that is. I forgot. And I mean, it has to do with this topic, but I'm not going to read all of this right here. So, <laughs> but I will definitely use this book in the future when um, I'm doing a video on agriculture in particular, but also just a lot of topics. Like this is a really good book. Um, so highly recommend. It's better than just being used to hold up my laptop, I swear. And we are on our next, our last section for next week. Yay! And it's called Rise. So let me read you the little thingies to get us pumped for the last section of the book. Can you imagine the community that will heal the climate crisis? It will not be just you. It will not be just technological salvation. It will be all of us. And let me read you the other little piece in there. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I really should have this, you know, bookmarked by now. Okay. Rise. Generations. Growing, giving, gathering. Nurture, community, and transformation. For a future that holds us, all of us. This is the work of our lifetimes. So it's a great compilation of just let's get going kind of thing. So without further ado, I am going to now mentally prepare myself for Taylor Swift releasing her reproduced album of Fearless. Um, but I hope you all enjoyed this. On uh, on Tuesday, we are going to talk about the infrastructure plan and you will get to meet Mikey, who is um, my, my friend who is helping us with the next book for the book club section. He is um, well, I'll go ahead and let him explain what his background is, but he's very knowledgeable about the topic and I'm excited to have him. And so we will talk about infrastructure with him on Tuesday and look for a short little fun video that I'm going to release tomorrow. Um, let's see. My hint is that little black blob over there that you can't even see. So it's a great hint. All right. <laughs> Remember to talk about the climate every single day and to support your local news organizations. Remember, we are all connected. I love that because it's true. And I've said it many times, but I love seeing it every single time. So anyways, thank you so much. And I will talk to you later. Bye. Goodbye. I'm leaving. See ya.